How you doing? It's Dean Kirk back on the countdown. I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> I've been under the weather. This is the first video I've made in about a week, and I've been under the weather this past weekend, and I'm, I'm still kind of recovering from it. The remnants of something, I'm not sure what I had, but uh, it brought me down just a little bit, so I might cough a little bit or make cough or clear my voice as this video goes along, so just please, please bear with me. I'm anxious to uh, get down on some obscure arm at number 36, Giorgio Tina Cherry. Does anybody remember Giorgio? I believe his real name was Giorgio Alantini. Back in the fall of 1987, or going into the fall of 1987, Giorgio Alantino, Alantini, back in the, particularly back in the 80s, the 90s, even into the 2000s, loved to put these obscure R&B records on my fancy playlist. R&B songs that did not have a chance of making it, making it on pop radio, or at least back in the 80s, it was called Contemporary Hit Radio, CHR. I remember one that I put in back in 1984. I remember Freak Show on the dance floor by the Parquets. Boy, that was a bad mama jamming record right there. And so is this record, Tina Cherry by Giorgio at number 36. Let me set the stage for you real quick on this record and uh, get into a little bit of history. Although I'll be honest with you, I don't know how accurate uh, some of the beginning history is, but here we go. Back in the fall of 1986, there was a rate, well, actually back, I'm trying to figure out how to start to try to tell this story. Well, here we go. Back in the fall of 1986, a radio station, an urban radio station in Los Angeles called KJLH 102.3. They were having an amateur music day, taking submissions for various local artists. Giorgio did not, he went to the radio station, in Los Angeles. No demo. All he had was a cassette tape. He had a song on there called Sex Appeal. He spent $500 making that record. He produced it himself. He sang on it. He played all the instruments on this record. And that's what he had, that cassette tape that he submitted to uh, KJLH back in the fall of 1986. Now, before I get to the rest of that story, a little bit of the beginning of Giorgio. According to one source, and boy, sources are all over the place sometimes, particularly when you get into a real obscure artist like this, and you're going down the time tunnel. You're going through, you're literally going through a fog. The mist of time. There are misty places everywhere you look, and you're just trying to make make some kind of sense out of the forms and figures and all that. But anyway, one source had it that he grew up in San Francisco, although born in Texas. His dad was a Navy pet, he was a Navy petty officer. His mom worked at Macy's. She was a salesperson at Macy's. Somewhere along the line, he was he wound up in Minneapolis. He had made a demo. He submitted the demo to Prince or somebody to or or somebody at Paisley Park. What happened there is unclear. He might have been encouraged, but about a few weeks later, he made Sex Appeal. He put together another tape, and he started up his own uh, record company. Well, his own record label is called Giorgio Records. So he's got this. Well, he's got a tape. He's made this song. He went to Los Angeles, and they gave him a runaround. Gave him a big runaround until he went to the radio station, KJLH, with their amateur music day. That would be his break. One of the DJs there, his name was Frankie Ross. He thought the song was rather unusual. It's kind of an electronic dance record infused, infused with R&B. This was a song that was definitely a rhythmic, a rhythmic, um, I'm trying to think of the word. I can't think of it right now. Well, of rhythmic latitude, for lack of a better word. I'm sure the better word would come after I'm done with this video. It always happens when I, every time I, I, after I make a video, when I'm not making a video, all the great words come. But anyway, uh, Frankie Ross, he thought the song was unusual. The, the program, well, actually, she was the music director, Lucia, I believe it's Lucia Torres. When she first heard the tape, she thought this, this song was going to be a hit. She thought it was a hit. Sex Appeal was going to be a hit. They played it, and the phones lit up. People are asking about, man, well, who's this? what's this new Prince record? I never heard this before. It was a Prince-like record. And he got a deal. Giorgio then got a deal with uh, McCullough Records, they, they, a distribution deal of sorts. 
And he sold 9,000 copies of Sex Appeal in four days in Los Angeles. That caught the attention of Russ Reagan, a very distinguished record mogul. He was uh, president of Motown's creative division. Now, Motown was not not the record label that it was back in the 60s and 70s. In the 60s and 70s, you're talking about the Four Tops, Supremes, Mary Wells, Gladys Knight, the Pips, the Spinners were at Motown for a while back in the early to mid, well, back in the 60s, and of course the Jackson Five, but uh, by the late 80s, though, they were just not quite the force that they were at one time. Nonetheless, Russ Reagan, this was a big guy. He heard he heard Sex Appeal. He invited, he met Giorgio. He invited him to lunch, and they worked out a record deal. He was so impressed. If I got this right, I wrote it down, so I got it from a pretty good source. One listen, right? He signed Giorgio to a multi-record contract. Seven years worth $7 million. Giorgio, he worked up his album. He produced it himself. He played all the instruments, the keyboards, overdub, guitars, bass, overdubs, and Sex Appeal went to number 58 on Billboard's Hot 100. That's the thing about Giorgio, and I remember it very uh, vividly. Giorgio was one of these artists that you kind of got into. Somebody who was not really big, but on the threshold, perhaps on the threshold of becoming big, but not quite becoming super popular. Not quite the iconic figure of, say, Michael Jackson or Prince. And, uh, but he, the sex appeal went to number 26 on R&B. Then came Tina Cherry. Tina Cherry, though, didn't do that well at all on Billboard's Hot 100. Only got as high as number 96. That is it. Top five, though, on R&B. Number one on the Dance Club Play charts. And then there was Lover's Lane. I thought that was one of his best ones, Lover's Lane. He's a pretty good rapper, too. He does a little talking, a little rapping. And I like the way on Tina Cherry, he's got that wah-wah thing going on, on, on the keyboards when he plays that key keyboard. It adds a little flourish to the record. Um, Tina Cherry, Lover's Lane, boy, the winner of 87 and 88. He got down on that, but no cigar on Billboard's Hot 100. Only got as high as number uh, 59. I take that back. I got to make a correction. I effed up. Lord have mercy. I effed up. Sex Appeal was actually, actually, Sex Appeal went to number 58, and it went on Billboard's Hot 100, and it went to number 16 on R&B. It was Lover's Lane that went to number 59 on Billboard Top 100 and number 26 on r and I think I might have got those two confused. And that's all I got. It's a good R&B record. If you haven't heard it before, like that 80s R&B, be a nice addition to your 80s collection right there. Giorgio Alentini with Tina Cherry at number 36 on my fancy playlist, August 29th, 1987.